are listening to the Take Back Podcast, where women of color creatives come together to inspire, empower, and encourage each other. I'm Jess Pillay, an Indo-Fijian independent singer-songwriter. And I'm Angelica Dianda, a Mexican-American licensed mental health counselor and singer. And this is the podcast where we explore and elevate stories from women of color who are artists, musicians, actors, entrepreneurs, and so on, who are navigating and taking back systems designed against them. Welcome back to the Take Back Podcast. Today is our 10th episode. Yay! Yay! I cannot believe that we now have 10 episodes under our belt. Can you believe it? We survived 10 episodes. (laughs) Oh, boy. I don't think people realize. I know we were literally having a conversation just before we started recording just how much work goes into doing a podcast. Yeah. But either way, I am so glad to do it with you. So for those that are here, we are so glad that you found us. We want to welcome you. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angelica Dianda, and I'm a Mexican-American licensed mental health counselor and singer. And I'm here with my co-host, Jess Pillay, who is an Indo-Fijian American independent singer-songwriter and storyteller. That's a mouthful. I It is. <laughs> it is. And this is a podcast where we talk to each other and with other incredible women of color creatives about what it takes to succeed in an industry that wasn't designed with people like us in mind. So if this is your first time listening to us, um, how I I'm a slightly <laughs> bit confused. How did you end up on episode 10? So um, thank you for being here. And please, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. And go back because there's nine more episodes that we would love for you to check out as well. If you're a returning listener, we want to thank you. Oh, thank you so much for being on this journey with Jess and I and for joining us on our 10th episode. Yeah, there's a million podcasts, like literally millions of podcasts you could be listening to. So the fact that you're choosing to spend your time with us really means a lot to us. Well, for today's episode, it's kind of a special one. Jess, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about what we'll be talking about for today? Yeah, well, it's been a minute since it's been just you and me. So the last several episodes, we've been talking to other guests and getting to amplify their stories. And one thing that we've noticed as we've been doing these interviews is almost every single episode, the theme of imposter syndrome has come up. Now, that's something that you and I have talked about for years in our own journeys. And then we started doing these interviews and realized, okay, we're definitely not alone. It seems like every single person we've talked to has struggled with it in some capacity. And, you know, here we are 10 episodes into this show and we're still like we still struggle with it. Yeah. Constantly. Right. And so what we thought we would do is do a little bit of a deep dive into what imposter syndrome is. Talk about how it impacts people, especially women of color creatives. And then we want to give you some tools and resources so that the next time you're struggling with imposter syndrome, you'll have these tips and tools that you can use to fight back. So let's start with what it is. And Helika, as our resident mental health expert, can you just tell our listeners like a quick synopsis of what it is? And the reason I bring up the mental health thing is because I'm sure not only are you hearing about imposter syndrome in the capacity of this podcast, but also with the clients that you work Mm -hmm. with in therapy. Yeah. So if you could give us a little bit of a definition. Yeah. So I found this definition through um, Harvard Business Review, and I think they do such a great job to define what this thing is. So their definition is imposter syndrome can be defined as a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evidence of success. Hmm. The imposters suffer from chronic self-doubt and a sense of intellectual fraudulence that override any feelings of success or external proof of their competence. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is this podcast is aimed at women of color. That's really the stories and the voices that we're choosing to explore. But one thing I noticed as I was doing my own research on imposter syndrome is that it affects 
just about everybody. Yep. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you're commercially successful. You know, you could be a person who on the kind of spectrum of privilege mm-hmm. is at the top end right. and you really have a lot of privilege in your life. Those folks struggle with it. So it's kind of a universal thing. Everybody right. kind of deals with it in some way. So, you know, if you're listening and you find yourself sitting there going, yep, that's me. I have imposter syndrome or have struggled with it. You're in good company. <laughs> you totally are. You are not alone, you know. So if you're feeling alone, know that you're not. We are with you and we, you know, support you and want to give you resources and tools to hopefully overcome it. And if you're one of those rare people out there who really doesn't struggle with it for whatever mm-hmm. reason... Tell us your secrets. We want to know. How did you learn to ditch imposter syndrome? Because we still have it. Oh, boy. Do we have it? And sometimes it can be a daily struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes there we could go maybe weeks or months and then, bam, it just shows it's a really ugly, nasty face. Yep. Um, and then sometimes it can knock you, knock you right back down. So... I think one thing that I'm really interested in asking you about Mm -hmm. as a therapist, but also just with your cultural background and your upbringing, do you think that cultural and personal history, background, all that kind of stuff plays into how we experience imposter syndrome? It very well could. Yeah. And I and I can't speak, you know, for, you know, all women of colors out there, but um, or even creatives out there. But I can speak definitely from my own experience Mm -hmm. and absolutely my background, my cultural uh, background, my upbringing within my family, even within the community and the fears of community that I interacted with up to this point, totally contributed. And I think a lot of it has to do with here in my my little psychology bit (laughs) of how little subtle messages that we pick up over time, then just kind of um, solidified and build this internal narrative that we have about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And for some people, um, this internal narrative can either be an uplifting and encouraging narrative of themselves and belief of self, or the opposite, where it is a narrative of negativity and self-doubt and shame. And that's where imposter syndrome loves to thrive Mm -hmm. in that arena. I think you're hearing too comments from other people. And this is where those voices, even internal, then get solidified is comments, feedback, nonverbal body cue and messages. I mean, even now being in the field that I'm in, you know, I didn't go into school. I didn't go into college thinking I'm going to become a counselor. But somehow down the path, here I landed, I landed in this role now more than a decade in. And there have been seasons where I have really questioned my competency, how well I'm doing things, how well I understand things, because I didn't get a piece of paper that said, Mm. you know, bachelors of science in psychology. And I'm questioning that. But here I am. Even though you have a master's in it. I am less than the 5% yeah. in the United States that's a Latina that has a master degree. And then I here I have this evidence that says you are capable, you have the knowledge, you have the degree, you have the experience. Mm-hmm. But yet here comes that little internal voice saying, eh, are you sure you know this? Eh, are you sure so, you know what you're talking about? Let me ask a question. You and I are both very familiar with that internal voice that you're talking about. I definitely know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I remember Chelsea Green also talked about that in her episode. So if you haven't listened to that one, go and check that one out. I'm curious to know where the foundation, like somewhere, how was that voice born, do you think? So like, was there anything that happened in your life when you were growing up? externally or whatever that sort of made you open up the door for that internal voice to start speaking those things um to you is this a, like mo- supposed to be like my therapy session are you not my <laughs> <Got> therapist <you>. <laughs> yeah i'm not the one with the, the, the counseling degree <laughs> we just did a switcheroo <laughs> we just did a major switcheroo. i found my next career you guys <laughs> um you know that is a really really good question you know honestly there's really nothing that stands like that really sticks out. I will say there's been a lot of research specifically regarding people and negative messaging that have ADHD. Yes, I just shared a secret on the podcast. 
I'm neuro quirky and neurodiverse. <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> so neuro, neuro spicy <laughs> is another one too. But all that to be said, I think I had saw somewhere that by the time a child with ADHD reaches the age of 12 years old, that they receive 20 thousand more negative messaging about their behaviors and actions than their neurotypical counterparts. And all that to be said, now that's, like I said, a very particular group of individuals. Now, if we're thinking about imposter syndrome with people of color, there's so many nuances. One is the internal voice. But where did the internal voice come from? And I do think a lot of it has to do with the interactions and the spaces that we're in. So, for example... If you're the only brown person Mm -hmm. at your work or the only like woman of color at the table and everyone's white or everyone's, you know, cisgendered or what have you, and you're looking around and navigating that on your own, Mm -hmm. of course, there's going to be some things that can start bubbling up if you don't know how to navigate and or shut off that voice Mm -hmm. in your head or those doubts. And it goes back to that question. You said, like, where did it come from? Well, I don't know. And I think for oftentimes there might not be a pivotal like moment. It probably happens over a collection of like of time. a span of time yeah. and it could be little subtle moments mm-hmm. well it makes sense because a lot of times one thing that we as women of color and just people of color in general deal with is that constant question of like do i belong here right we right. just that's a normal part when you grow up in america or you when you grow up in a white majority environment like we both did right. that's just something you deal with on the daily right, right. Even if nobody's projecting that message like explicitly that Mm -hmm. we don't belong there, we put that on ourselves. So those internal voices are just really loud for us. So it makes sense to me that imposter syndrome would kind of show up more often for us or in a very kind of explicit and regular way. And that even if the external kind of environment didn't explicitly tell us that we don't Mm -hmm. belong that's that's the subtext that we sort of find in the environments that we're in but you know it's interesting just hearing you talk about this it's fascinating to me that you're like i can't think of that salient specific moment where that internal voice suddenly came to life or was Mm -hmm. birthed within me i actually can Mm. for myself so for me when i was a little kid you know elementary school whatever and then up even through middle school and high school Every time a report card came home, so God bless my dad, but he did the very sort of stereotypical Indian dad thing where he's looking at my report card and he's like, A, B, whatever, you know, I was always like a mediocre student. I never had straight A's. My brothers did. I did not. And I would do great in the humanities. Always did well in like history, English, all of those types of classes. Science and math, not so much. Mm-hmm. So he would look at my report cards and he'd scan all the the good, quote unquote, good grades. And then he'd get to the math and science grade. And he's like, why'd you get a C in math? So my mom eventually called him out a couple times and said, how come you never acknowledge and recognize the A's? Like, right. why, why are you so focused on where she didn't do well? And honestly, really what it was is like, there's a need here. We got to fix this, you know, so he'd get kind of focused on that. But there wasn't a lot of affirmation for the stuff that I was good at. It was almost like, yeah, this is just expected of you. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, in the Indian American community and, in you know, just in Indian culture in general, there is such a high emphasis on academic achievement and all of that. So for me, in my mind, it was just like, well, I guess I'm dumb. Mm. Like literally, would yeah. that's what I thought for years. I guess I'm just dumb and bad at math. It's interesting, though, because I feel like now I've gotten into this headspace, even when I do something really well, it is so ingrained in me from that childhood experience mm-hmm. to try to find what's wrong, right? right? And to some extent, that can serve me well. Mm-hmm. Like as a musician, that can actually sometimes serve me well. Right. So you can ask Sam, our editor, this. I record music with him frequently. And there's been many a time where I've been in this very vocal booth and I'm like, let's do another take. Right. And he's like, we already did 12. You're good. <laughs> like, you don't need to do another one. Right. And I'm like, no, no, I got to I gotta keep going. I got to right. just, you know, because to me, it's like, 
there's some perfect take or moment or whatever that I just haven't grabbed yet that's out there and I got to keep trying to find it. But really what it is, is it's it's that trauma, right? right. If that's the word we're going to use to define that experience of growing up and sort of having the good stuff glossed over yeah. to the point where now I'm like, I'm always looking for what can I, right. you know, improve. Well, that's exactly it, you know, and kind of going back to my story of the profession that I'm in now, you know, there was many, many years where I really doubted my ability in the work that I did just because a variety of reasons. One, right, a little freaking piece of paper that didn't say BS. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. Ha ha, that wasn't meant to be a joke, but <laughs> literally like, you know, bachelor, you know, bachelor of science, right? You know, mine said BA, bachelor of arts. And yes, I am a badass. So there you go. <laughs> but yes, you are. <laughs> but, you know, for the longest time, I thought that that just made me not as competent mm -hmm. as my colleagues. And in retrospect, now, man, I, I think wasted so many years doubting mm -hmm. and doubting my ability and doubting what I had to offer to the table. And it's really, I would say now in the last several years that I'm starting to embrace and to acknowledge my competencies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, just earlier today, I had um, a meeting with an intern that I am supporting right now. So someone that's in their learning. Mm -hmm. And so we were in a meeting with um, their advisor at their university and a question got brought up. And I started giving them some feedback. And at one point, their um, advisor chimed in. They're like, Angelica is telling you some stuff that you would literally be hearing right now from your professors mm. at the university. I was like, I heard that. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. But, you know, I it think. It makes sense. You've been in the field as right. long as you have. But you know what? Yeah. If, if this would have been five years ago, mm -hmm. I would have heard that. The imposter voice would have The imposter it. voice would have taken that, got gone the filter in my head and would have like, I wouldn't have been able to hear that. Yeah. And now hearing it, I was like, oh, okay, so I guess I could be a professor if I wanted to. Okay, <laughs> noted. Hey, I actually said that to you at one I point. Know, do you remember? I know, I do. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out I there know. on the record. I did <laughs> encourage you to try that track. I know you did. But, you know, all that to said, it was a reminder. I was like, okay, I do know my stuff. Mm -hmm. And yes, I've invested so much time. Do I know everything? No. Am I evolving? Absolutely. And to believe, mm -hmm. right, in the evolution and the knowledge that I, I bring in, it is kind of a way where I'm fighting back against that voice mm -hmm. that's telling me otherwise. Well, and another way to actually look at it is you're kind of embracing the voice in a way, mm -hmm. right? To say... Well, okay, if I don't know everything or if there's more work to be done or there's more to learn, instead of viewing that as a negative, which is often what imposter syndrome kind of tells us to do, it's actually an opportunity to adopt more of a growth mindset, right? right? And to say, okay, I don't know everything. Right. I think it's actually really problematic when we get to that state of being like, all right, we figured it all out, right? right? That's actually going to stunt our growth mm -hmm. and create a lot of issues. So you know, I didn't when we were planning this episode, I didn't even go into thinking about like, are there any benefits to imposter syndrome? And I don't know that there necessarily are. But what happens if we're also just kind of like, OK, we have it right. and use it as an opportunity to actually learn and grow and right. still develop ourselves well, it, like it can it that taking back concept. It, it, right? What it is. Let's because, take it back. And, and I love that. And you know what? That is such a different shift, mm. you know, and I know that that's not initially where we were going but you're absolutely right okay so let's switch gears a little bit we've been talking at least with your experience a lot about your experiences with imposter syndrome in your therapeutic space and working as a mental health professional what about in your creative life and I'm going to actually prompt you so here's an observation that I made when we were first getting into this podcast and kind of writing our taglines and our early scripts. And I think it was me who threw on there that you're a mental health counselor and a singer. And you struggled with that, right? Do you I remember did. that? You had a really hard time owning that title for yourself. Why is that? 
Well, I know why. It's because, which is so silly to say this out loud, thinking about it, but the reality is I struggled with that because it's not what I do professionally, Mm. right? I think a lot of people, when they think of who am I, the first thing that they say is their name and what they do, Mm -hmm. right? And typically is what they do is their profession. Mm -hmm. And with singing, you know, it is just something that is, has literally been there since as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I recently made some new connections and we had to do like this, you know, story share to kind of dive in a little bit deeper about who we were. And I told them, you know, as I was explaining about who I am, that singing and music has just been so ingrained that if I could have come out of my mother's womb singing songs, I probably (laughs) would have. (laughs) I probably would have. But um, I don't know. Once again, along along the way, the messaging, probably, you know, societal messaging and the, the hustle lie culture. of capitalism. capitalism. <laughs> That's what that is. It, it is. Pinchy capitalism anyway. <laughs> so, but... Um, but all, right, like that's... Is. We have been steeped in a society that tells us that if you're not, like, making money from something... Right. That it somehow is less of your profession. And like, I get it. There's something, you know, there's stuff we have to do to pay our bills. That's just the world that we live in. But you have a degree in music. I know. You've done it on a professional level. You're on recordings, some of mine even. And so (laughs) it's like you've worked in a studio. You've done all these things. And yet you've had this really hard time that I've observed, like letting go of that imposter voice and owning that Mm -hmm. identity for yourself. Yeah. Right. And I don't know what that says about me because I was like, I'm an independent singer. (laughs) But because a while ago, (laughs) but because you had to do your own work. To be able to, I did. Be I able to it say that. took me a long time to let go of worship leader and that whole identity, right. and start really actively claiming the independent singer songwriter thing. Even though I'm still not re- really making a whole lot of money off of that, you right. know. So anyway, I just thought that was something that was worth us discussing because I think it's a perfect example of what we're talking about in that we don't have it all together. We're still learning and fighting with this stuff ourselves and, you know, learning to let go of Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a work in progress. So how do we change these narratives? How do we start to take back our creative confidence and have greater impact as artists and as women? It all starts with knowing the lens and understanding for you in particular what activates that sense of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think it's so crucial and important. Um, And part of that process is you really, you kind of have to attune to yourself, but in a very nuanced way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And part of that process too is saying what's happening then in this situation Mm. that's bringing up these emotions, these sensations, these thoughts, right? What's happening. I don't want to use the T word. Mm -hmm the trigger <laughs> but that's essentially what it is right yeah. it's, it's knowing what activates and kickstarts that whole cycle and that loop that happens that imposter syndrome loves to do yep is so vital to kind of then get out of the loop and out of that cycle yeah so i'll, I'll share some of my triggers because this might be relevant for other people who are listening and so here's a couple things that i've noticed about myself lack of feedback and encouragement Mm -hmm. Which has been actually really hard with having a podcast that's so new and trying to build something is like, you know, we've talked about this. Like when people, you know, no offense to our listeners, this is not to shame you all. But like, (laughs) really, it's not. We're so glad you're here. But, you know, when we don't get like reviews or, you know, when we just are not hearing from people, we're kind of just seeing statistics on a dashboard and we're like, is this resonating? Are people listening? Are these bots that are <laughs> clicking on our show? Right. Like, who or is even it just, knows? Is it me like accidentally like clicking <laughs> yeah, on did it? Did I like, just <laughs> click on it a whole bunch of times? But it's like just having that total lack of acknowledgement right. about certain things really puts me into that headspace of like, I guess I'm not good. I guess I don't belong here. You know, just that. that I immediately get into that thinking pattern and those negative kind of traps that you're talking about. Right. 
you know, I think for me, one of the things that has been challenging in navigating this, you know, one one area um, where I've seen that, and I know, I know we've talked about this. In fact, you saw me, you saw me in some of these like loops is uh, yeah. when uh, I was getting ready to become a mom and I mm-hmm. found out I was pregnant. You know, um, I'm not a young mom. I'm a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a slightly mature mother. <laughs> but, you know, when I became a mom, it was a very cautious decision. But even then, um, for many, many years, my partner really wanted to start a family and I had my hangups about mm-hmm. it, you know. Oh, this and that, and it has to. I mean, a to be way. fair, you also have to carry the child, so there's that extra <laughs> I mean, labor there, there, involved there for is. you. There is, <laughs> quite but, literally, pun but, intended. The, <laughs> you know, actually, when we were preparing for this episode, I saw a TikTok video mm-hmm. of this individual, also Latina, same age as me, had been with her partner for about the same amount of time that I've been with my partner and started talking about finding out that she was pregnant and this should be this joyous, momentous moment because she waited and she worked and mm-hmm. she's achieved so much. But then the struggle of like, but why don't I feel this joy? Mm. And then she started to unpack it, which I was like, oh, holy shit, <laughs> which goes back to messaging. Yeah. And the messaging that was given to her, and I was like, that's not that far off different than the messaging that I got growing up, right. which is... You are a child of either immigrant parents or a minority where there is just this assumption that can happen if you are a Latina and do not become another statistic, do not become a teenage parent, do not become Mm -hmm. a young parent because what happens, you become a young parent and then that then stops all the things that maybe you had set in mind for yourself because now you have to tend to this child. And so thinking about that and hearing her, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. If you're told all this time, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. You kind of went into that hyper focus almost of like, I got to keep achieving, which I know they're not the same. I'm not equating these two things, but it's kind of like what I was talking about earlier with the studio experience for me. um, Obviously not on the same level at all. I'm not implying that they are, but... For, that's the only context I have to right. compare it to. But it's that like, I got to do more. I got to keep going. I got to keep achieving before I'm fully ready or before this right. thing is fully right. Exactly. Right? So for you, it was years and years of I got to make more money. I got to do this. I got to establish absolutely. myself. Right. You know, or, you know, my husband and I have to do this and this to really get ready. Right. Even though reality is you probably were ready. We We probably were. So I saw that video. It resonated so yeah. much. And it was a different perspective that I never even considered mm-hmm. before. Is like, how then does the messaging, the cultural messaging that we get Going about specific things, question. right? Yep. The earlier question. Yep. And then how did that become the loop in my head? Yep. Okay. So what do we do about it? Right. That's the next question. And how do we address this stuff. So we wanted to share some examples with you all of things that we've sort of found to be tried and true and beneficial in our Mm -hmm. own journeys. So for me, as an artist, it's really adopting the mindset of practice makes progress, not practice makes perfect, Mm -hmm. right? As somebody who does consider herself a perfectionist, I have to work really hard at this one. Yeah. But it's actually something that uh, my guitar teacher and I used to talk about a lot when I first started taking guitar lessons because I had this level of impatience of like, I just want to get good at this instrument. I think it was hard being, you know, fairly proficient at piano for so long and then adding something in that I had to just start from scratch Mm -hmm. with where it's like, I have to build calluses. I can't just get good at this overnight. And, and re- you know, reminding myself that it actually took years of practicing piano and, and getting decent at it. That's not going to happen with guitar instantaneously, right? And so we would talk a lot about this, this messaging of practice makes progress and learning to reject that perfectionism mm-hmm. and realizing that if I sit down and practice today for 15 minutes and I can play this one chord transition better than yesterday, it might not be good enough yet to put on a recording. But guess what? I made progress. Right. And that counts. And the other thing that I've been really challenging myself to do is to make bad art. <laughs> like, it's so hard, but it's so important to just... It- 
make art for the sake of making art and treating it as a learning opportunity and not always being so concerned about what the final product right. will look like. And this is where I'm going to go on my old lady social media rant. <laughs> <laughs> and Ellie is like, oh, no, here it here comes. Here we go. <laughs> um, but, you know, we do live in this culture right now where it's like we're so focused on output and sharing right. everything. And you know, there's like the everything is content, like that whole meme I know, that's which out there. I, yes, I know you've given me a lot of shit for that, too. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have. But but the reality of it is like when we get so focused on that whole mentality of I have to create something so I can share it so that it can get likes or it right. can turn into some sort of a data point in my life. Mm -hmm. We actually lose, I think, in a lot of cases, the joy of just creating. Right. Right. And so I've been really struggling with this lately, just sitting down at the piano to just play the piano, mm -hmm. you know, or grabbing the guitar and letting myself just get lost in playing and not being so concerned about like, is this going to make it onto a record or right. you can't really like fully embrace the artistic process if you're not committed to the process right. part of that. Right. And then this is another thing that I do not do well, but I'm going to put it out there for our listeners, especially those of you who are working in creative contexts. I think a little creativity every day mm -hmm. is super important. I think too often those of us who are perfectionists especially have this tendency to think the circumstances, the mindset, right. the moment, the space, the day, everything has to be aligned in order for me to sit down and grab the guitar. Yes. And I remember actually one of our music theory professors from college saying it's so much better for you to sit down for 20 minutes and practice your instrument for just 20 minutes than to say, I'm going to wait until the end of the week and then, you know, sit here for two hours. Like right. the 20 minutes that you do, there's actually like scientific mm -hmm. proof behind this. That consistency of those incremental 20 minutes can actually benefit you a lot more than when you just cram it all into the end of the week because it feels right. right. You know, the timing feels right or whatever. So, so do a little bit every day and don't worry if it's bad. And don't worry, I'm going to be countercultural cultural here but don't worry about posting it if you mm -hmm. want to post it if that brings you joy if that's awesome. something that's you know good for your mental health or whatever and for your creative process do it by all means right but I think what I'm realizing more and more is I'm a very private person yeah. and I don't need to have my whole life out there I just don't need to put everything out there and that's what's good for me. And, you know, I know you have found community and things about social media that have sort of been more helpful and beneficial mm -hmm. to you. We're all different. It's exactly. different for every person. So figure out what works for you and do that. And maybe that means in some cases not necessarily posting all the time, right, right. you know. And then the other thing, we kind of talked about this actually, speaking of social media, in a reel that you made recently yeah. about rest. But this idea of sort of taking in creativity yes. as well, right? Like there's the creative output that we do as creators. And then there's also something really powerful about absorbing right. other people's creativity and sort of filling that creativity tank, mm -hmm. right? My producer that I worked with on my EP literally calls it that, the creativity tank. And he always talks about this idea of like going out into nature or listening to a record that really inspires you or going to see live music or whatever it is, right. you know, that's going to help you feel like you're actually pouring into the vessel that you will then mm -hmm. use to create with. And then, you know, for my music peeps out there, you probably know Ari Herstand, but he uses the phrase inspiration quests, which mm. I think is really fun. And this idea of sort of going out, you know, and going on a little adventure and like finding ways to really, again, fill yourself up creatively and sort of being in a place of just absorbing right. rather than constantly output, 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 right. output. So one thing that I have found is when you spend more time being inspired and letting yourself be inspired, whether it's listening to live music or reading a great book or watching a movie or whatever it might be, it actually doesn't leave a whole lot of room for that imposter voice right. to get in as much because your attention is now taken up by something that is actually a lot better yeah. for you. So 
those are some of my tips. You know, um, one thing, and this was actually something that I shared with you, as cheesy as it sounds, I'm sure you've seen like 101 therapists out there that talk about this on IG or TikTok, but affirmations really, truly do help. Mm -hmm. But there's a specific way that you can do it that will be helpful and meaningful for you Mm -hmm. instead of just doing the cheesy like, I'm awesome. I'm great. Well, yes, yes, you are. You are awesome. You are. (laughs) But there are ways that you can incorporate affirmations in your daily life that will really pack a punch but in a positive way for you one way and this was actually something that was done as a morale booster for a previous team Mm. that I was in that every week um, when we were in meetings we had an affirmation jar Mm -hmm. where we would write down things that happened that week or someone that wanted to give a shout out um, or give specific like positive feedback for something that another team member did Mm -hmm. and we would write it down and we would put in this jar and then we would draw it out and then we made it fun where we would draw like we would win little cheesy like little tchotchke prizes but but what was cool is i saved a lot of those Mm -hmm. and there were moments and I would save them and I put them in my own little like jar on my desk and the days or in the moments that I was either just really having a shitty day or I don't know, just like just something that maybe had one awry and I was not feeling my, the best version of myself. Mm-hmm. I would go into that jar and I would pull out a slip and I would read it and I would see the words that someone said about me and how yeah. I helped them or how I made an impact for them or for, a, you know, for the team or what things that they appreciated about me. And that that would just kind of give me a little boost. And mm-hmm. a variation of this is that I um, I still occasionally do is creating an equivalent of like a virtual affirmation folder totally. and saving emails or comments um, yeah. or feedback or things like that into a virtual folder. And same thing when I need to see something and I need to read things to remind me of what I've done well, mm-hmm. I go through there and I read that. So that really helps a lot, right? Because mm-hmm. these are things that people say and tell you. And sometimes we do need that. We need that feedback and the affirmation from and sources outside of ourselves. It's easier actually to believe it and hear it from somebody else because right. at the end of the day, it's like they don't owe me anything. You know, nobody has to encourage me if, if they're choosing of their own free will to affirm me in these ways. I don't know. I find that sometimes to be a little bit easier to actually believe versus right. like, you know, you know, which I'm sure I need to go talk to a therapist and unpack why I don't believe myself a lot of times. That's a whole nother conversation, whole nother conversation. for another time. <laughs> but it really it really does, you know, make a difference, like you said, when it comes from other voices sometimes. Which really kind of leads to what I was going to talk about next, which is this idea of surrounding yourself with people who do build you up. Right. You know, which is partly why we started this podcast, because we really want this to become a community where it's not just us sitting here talking to each other or talking to the other women that we bring on as guests, but for our listeners, especially the women of color listeners who are creatives, connecting with each other and being able to build that community. And one of the things that you talked about that you had shared with me is surrounding yourself with the reminders mm-hmm. of all the effort and the work that you've done. In fact, I can attest to this. Yeah. Like, I've seen how Jess has set this up, even in her own creative space. Yeah. You want to share a little bit more what what I'm talking about? My home studio? Yes. Yeah. So first of all, I really try to put stuff on the walls and around me that inspires me. So I've literally got photos of favorite songwriters, people who inspire me creatively. I actually have like a framed autograph from Rachel Yamagata. Yes, There's the reference. Do. Hey. <laughs> I don't know where we're at in our little tally. I don't know. I'm sure someone, hey, someone who's listening, if you want to leave a, a comment or a review yeah. saying, hey, <laughs> where, on episode where are we 10, t- your, tally. Uh, your tally is, regarding Rachel comments uh, are at this point. Right? Yes. Whatever, whatever it is. So all that to say. But, you know, she signed a notebook that I shared with her years ago when we met her and said, I'm a songwriter, too. And, you know, whatever. It was super cheesy and kind of cringe but she was really lovely about it and she wrote this beautiful little note in this notebook that I have that I do a lot of my lyric writing in and so I actually printed another version of that Mm -hmm. and framed it and put it on the wall right next to my practice space where my keyboard is so that when I'm practicing I can look up and see that note from her and if I'm kind of dealing with writer's block or whatever it's like it's there you know it's that physical 
reminder. And then, you know, when I took my job that I now have, yeah. you know, my day job, um, it's a writing job. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have an English degree and I graduated years ago and I, for whatever reason, never really had my diploma like properly framed and displayed. Yeah. And finally, when I got this job, I put it up. And it's now kind of behind me on the wall when I'm on like a Zoom call. So people I'm talking to at work or whatever, probably, you know, I'm sure they see it, but they don't know what it necessarily symbolizes. But for me, it's that physical reminder where I, you know, look into the screen and I see this thing hanging on the wall. And you see yourself. And I see myself, you know, in that reflection. Yep. And it's that constant active reminder that like, hey, you spent tons of time tons of money, tons of tears right. <laughs> at times, you know, to earn that thing. You're right. the first one in your family to do it. Right. You broke the cycle of people not going to college and you did it. And right. now you're working in a job that's actually paying you to do that very thing. Right. And, you know, it's just it's something that I needed to to remind myself. Oh, I love of. that. So. Yeah. So all of you guys who have certificates or degrees or pieces of paper that says that you are qualified, post that up. Including Angelica, who has not framed hers <sighs> to this point. Um, I did not know that I was going to get called out the way that I On did the today. internet. <laughs> On the internet. Thanks, bestie. <laughs> I'm such a great friend. <laughs> oh, man. Yes, you oh. are. <laughs> so what about guests that we've had there were a couple of things that we noticed in a couple of episodes that really spoke to imposter syndrome do you want to kind of share what what those were yeah so this was actually one of my favorite moments the episode where chelsea green was talking very candidly about navigating imposter syndrome she kind of used this analogy the way that i visualize in my head is like imposter syndrome kind of being like this little like this little tiny little bug that just kind of lands on your like shoulder. a devil on her shoulder the devil yeah. on her shoulder this just this little like pesky little thing that's just kind of beating you crap And I just love Chelsea. She's like, sometimes I just, I literally, like guys, she literally will imagine that she flicks it off of her shoulder. (laughs) And I was like, oh, that's fucking brilliant. Like, I love that. Because one, it's, it's a good visual, but not only that's like, she's literally doing a tangible movement, Mm -hmm. right? It's just like, like kind of just like brushing it off, brushing off her shoulders. Like, no, I, I'm done. Like, get get away. Like, that was such a brilliant moment, and it stuck it's with such me. A, it's a take back, right? Yes, it in is. that moment, you're literally saying, "Get out of here! I'm taking back, you know, my authority, my expertise, my right. space. You don't belong here. I'm not going to let you have right. a voice and a place here." And then another moment too was Sherry Lynn Lee's advice, where she talked about curating your space, mm-hmm. right? I know we just talked a whole lot about that just now, Jess. But, you know, sometimes it is important for us to be in environments and in spaces that remind us of all the hard labor and work that we've done, but also that inspire us as well. Mm -hmm. So I highly, highly encourage um, you, um, our listener, that take an inventory of the space that you're in, right? Whether it's in your home, in at your op- friendships, yeah. right? Because those spaces are really going to either uplift and encourage you or do the opposite. And I would hope that they are just continually just kind of pushing you forward and encourage you to keep doing the work. And sometimes we don't always have the flexibility, like to go back to your point from earlier about, you know, when you're in an office, for example, right. where you're the only person who looks like you and you've already feel kind of isolated. So I think it's all the more important in these other spaces where you do have control to say, let me really try to create a space and an environment where I can thrive, where Mm -hmm. I can take back, where I can succeed. And I think a huge one that we so often miss, and this is a big point that she was making, was social media and and where we spend our time online. It is so important now more than ever to curate that space and to make sure that your feed is actually good for your mental health because so often 
often it's not, right? Exactly. And I totally 110% disagree with that sentiment. It's just like, please, please, please be attuned to yourself and see whatever you're consuming. How does it make you feel at the end mm-hmm. of the day? If you feel even more drained or crappy, then really take a hard look and see where am I investing my time and energy and how do I need to shift that in a way that's going to make me feel better, positive, or just more grounded within myself. Mm -hmm. And that can be social media. That could even be little things that you do throughout the day, little moments, even down to the things that you're listening to. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to just kind of leave you with a couple of tools and resources, things that you can use for further research, reading, all that kind of stuff. We're going to have a bunch of this stuff in our show notes, but I know you wanted to draw attention to the Imposter Syndrome Institute, which Mm -hmm. is one, and a couple other things on our list. So why don't you share a little bit about that. Yeah. So the Imposter Syndrome Institute is a fantastic resource of information, infographs. They also do some trainings as well of all the research that's done about how imposter syndrome really truly has impacted folks and what to do about it. So I would highly encourage you guys to take a look at their website. Um, There's a couple of great Instagram posts, not to toot my own horn. (laughs) shameless plug so there was a reel that was created a while back talking about imposter syndrome you can go on our ig account um, and find that under the reels tab and we break down just very very practical easy ways where you can fight back the voice of imposter syndrome there was another um, instagram post that we wanted to highlight um, which was a post that jess actually found and shared with me regarding um, how family culture can foster and support imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. and what to do about it, which was um, also an eye-opening read as well. Yeah, so we'll have a link to that. And then there's a couple of other articles that we've come across. I mean, we'd be here for another 30 minutes (laughs) if we were to break down all of these resources, but we'll put the links in so you all can check that out. There's a lot of great information out there on imposter syndrome, which Mm -hmm. again, just confirms what we were saying that so many people struggle with it. But we encourage you to go and do that research and Mm -hmm. find things that really resonate with you and, you know, help you in that journey. Um, We hope that this has been helpful to you as you're navigating your own creative journey and just your life. And again, you know, if you're one of those people who doesn't struggle with this, or maybe you have kind of come out to the other side. Share your secrets. Yeah, (laughs) share your secrets. (laughs) We want to know. We really do. You know, but I bet you have people in your life, maybe your friends, your children, your parents, you know, other people in your life that you're supporting who struggle with it. So, you know, this is where I'm going to specifically talk to especially people in the creative industry who have clients who Mm -hmm. are women of color, right? So I think we've sort of build this podcast in a way as this thing that's really for women of color. It's by women of color. And that's true, of Mm -hmm. course. But I think it's just as important for people who don't identify in that category who are serving women of color to be listening and hopefully finding some tools and insights into how to better support the women of color clients that they have. Absolutely. Yeah. So we hope this episode has given you just better insight into what imposter syndrome is and how to help people in your life who are struggling with it or how to help yourself if you are struggling with it. Thanks for joining us. We are so glad that you listened this far into the episode and for, you know, being here um, as we celebrate a milestone with episode number 10. If you like what you're hearing on this podcast, please take a minute to leave us a rating and a review. Would ever platform that you're listening to do it before my imposter syndrome kicks in (laughs) (laughs) y'all give us some feedback we need it jess is saying please give us data that's what she's saying (laughs) called out see now i got called out (laughs) oh my gosh Yes, but please, I mean, really true. We value you um, value you guys, value your opinions, because if this is resonating, we want to know. Yeah. We want to know. And there's really no way that we're going to know that based off of analytics. We really do and need to hear. And if it's not resonating, you're like, oh, this sucks. We still want to <laughs> like, know. We want to know so we can make this better <laughs> exactly. and approach it in a way that is going to add value to your life. And yeah. if you have someone that immediately came to mind that you think that need to hear this, please Share, 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 share. Yes. Share the show and share some more. Yeah. <laughs> share, share it. <laughs> share it with your friend, right? Your or mom. Or two, your mom. 
except our moms who only expect it to be on YouTube. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but please share it because when you share, you are partnering right alongside with us yeah. in being able to amplify um, such valuable and important voices and stories. We also invite you to check out our website at thetakebackpodcast.com where you can sign up to join our mailing list. We give our mailing list subscribers extra content that does not get released anywhere else. So if you want some exclusive material, please sign up and follow us on Instagram as well at the Take Back Podcast. And last but not least, we want to take a moment and say thank you to some amazing people that have partnered alongside of Jess and I to make this podcast happen. And so we want to give a thank you to our sound engineer and audio editor, Sam Cut Stunts. Thank you, buddy. He's on the other Yay. side of the of this Thanks, room. Sam. He, <laughs> thank you, He's Sam. He's smiling at us. <laughs> We also want to thank our content and communications manager, Stephanie Lamb. Yay! Yay. Really, Steph is... We love her. We love her so much. So thank you, Steph, for all the hard work that you put in for this podcast. We really, truly could not do what we do without you. We also want to take a minute for Little Brother, our project (laughs) and operations manager, Dan Pillay. So thank you, bud. We really appreciate you as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And last but not least, we want to thank um, one of our newest members that yeah. have joined our team is our copy editor, Robin Severson. Thank you, Robin, so much for making sure that there are no grammar, grammar errors and everything looks good. Because <laughs> I know I, even with all my degrees, I still, <laughs> grammar is a struggle. So we, we thank you so much for all you do. Yeah, so that brings us to the end. Thank you all for listening. And we hope to see you again in the next episode. Want to be a creative revolutionary with us? Visit thetakebackpodcast.com to learn more.